arrive screaming out of the night, like a demon from the apocalypse, a raging orb of fire as bright as the sun. Its hellish glory sears our eyes, forcing us to avert them from our certain doom. As it forges its hideously indifferent path across our sky, the sea and land are torn asunder. Our world upends as the beast's immense electromagnetism flips our poles, dragging our planet with it. Noon becomes midnight, winter becomes infernal summer, and the works of man are blown to dust by the shifting earth. Those few who survive may wonder how we could have been so blind to its arrival, but we had warnings. This fireball had been known before, to earlier civilizations who had witnessed its wrath and survived. To the Babylonians, it was Nibiru. To the early Christians, it was Wormwood. But to the ruling Cabal, who for so long denied us knowledge of its existence, all the while working to ensure their own survival and dominion of the shattered new world, it was simply Planet X. With the world in the grass, the- Look, I can't do this, okay? I, I know I tend to skew formal in this channel, but there's no polite way to put this. That, uh, what you just heard up there, it's tripe, piffle, flapdoodle, bilge water, drain hair, Holstein excreta. It isn't true. It isn't even a particularly good sci-fi story. And yet, a shockingly large number of people still believe it. What you just heard is the broad outline of an apocalyptic narrative that's been circulating on the net since 1995. That's right, an internet meme older than Google. Older even than the much-abused phrase internet meme itself. Contrary to much you may have heard about it, the story had one, and only one, originator. A now 75-year-old retiree in Wisconsin named Nancy Leader. Nancy claims, with remarkable conviction, that she was abducted by aliens as a child, who placed an implant in her brain. But rather than the horrific traumas recounted by other alleged abductees like Whitley Stryber or Travis Walton, Nancy appears to have scored a golden ticket, for the celestial molesters promptly declared her their messiah. Her remit, they informed her, was to return to Earth and preach the bad news of the coming apocalypse. Planet X, Nibiru, the planet of the crossing, that would pass by Earth in 2003 and trigger the end of civilization. She first spread the word on pre-World Wide Web newsgroups like Astro, perplexing astronomy buffs, with claims like, quote, The hale -Bopp comet does not exist. It is a fraud, perpetuated by those who would have the teeming masses quiescent until it is too late. hale -Bopp is nothing more than a distant star, and will draw no closer. Unquote. For the record, hale -Bopp was one of the brightest and most spectacular comet apparitions of the last 100 years. Oddly enough, you can't find that comment on her website anymore. She once said in an interview with K-Rock FM that everyone should euthanize their pets in anticipation of the event and that, quote, a dog makes a good meal, unquote, for any potential survivors. After the world emerged from 2003 very much intact, Nancy retreated from the public eye. To this day, she continues to make various online proclamations in the name of her alien overlords, but now scrupulously avoids any direct mentions of when Planet X will appear. The train, however, was not about to stop just because she got off. The malignant snowball of crazy that is the internet had seized on the idea, and soon a whole cottage industry of entrepreneurial crackpots began selling their own dates for Planet X, along with books, videos, and whatever other tat they could shift for your supposedly soon-to-be-worthless coin. From 2003, the date shifted first to 2012, then 2013, then 2015, and then 2016, each new date seemingly oblivious to those that came before. In 2011, the madness finally infected old media in the form of Melancholia, a morose if beautiful film by the equally insane director Lars von Trier. This is not an episode about mad prophecies. If anyone wishes to debate the matter further, I direct you to the subject's Wikipedia page, right there which counters most of the standard arguments raised in forums such as this. I can vouch for its accuracy and comprehensiveness because, well, I wrote it. I mention Nancy and her successors mainly to illustrate a point. They may be an extreme case, but they nonetheless represent a common tendency humans have demonstrated since the dawn of exploration, painting dragons on the blank spots on maps.
From classical best series warning overzealous travelers to avoid the griffin or the basilisk, to Marco Polo's accounts of dragons and dog-headed men in Asia, we have tended to look over the lip of the known and fill the void with the fearful and the incongruous. People often speak of fear of the unknown, but that, aside from being a cliché, is also wrong. We cannot fear what we do not know. Rather, it is the incompletely known that is the greatest source of fear. To know just enough to know you don't know. To see the edges of your world as insecure, the fraying threads at the corners of your universe. These are the nagging uncertainties that, if dwelled upon, can inspire inquiry, wonder, or terror. All three play a role in the story I am about to tell, which concerns the gradual unraveling of our cozy preconceptions of the solar system, and the reactions of those who, wittingly or not, instigated it. For Planet X, far from the construct of a lone lunatic's delusion, or even the trite name for the setting of a hundred uninspired fifty sci-fi flicks, was in fact a serious hypothesis that perplexed scientific minds for the better part of a century. Planet X and similar phantom worlds have set imaginations on fire, for better or worse, for as long as we've known they could exist. And to tell their story, I shall have to go back to the very beginning. As we begin this story, it is important to remember that not all dragons are equal. Some are pure lunacy, others are wishful thinking, others are good scientific ideas handicapped by insufficient data, and a few, very occasionally, turn out to be real. Pursuing dragons is a noble and necessary part of science. Even if they're not there, you must still rule them out. The fact that many of the minds featured in this tale were exactly the kind of eccentric, kaleidoscopic thinkers that would consider chasing dragons has no bearing whatsoever on their ability with, or dedication to, science. This is particularly true of our first mind, who, without question, is one of the finest that ever lived. Friedrich Wilhelm Herschel, later Frederick William Herschel, or just William Herschel, is a man whose accomplishments, though little known today, are impossible to overstate. Indeed, it could be argued, and has been, that modern astronomy would not exist without William Herschel. He discovered and catalogued thousands of binary stars, nebulae, and other astronomical objects, when before the catalog was only hundreds strong. He discovered what we now call infrared radiation. Aside from the discovery for which he is chiefly known, his other solar system discoveries include four moons and the fact that Mars has seasons. He was one of the first to suggest that stars have lifespans and eventually die, and also the first to make a serious attempt to plot our position within our own galaxy. And yet, if people today know of him at all, it is in reference to a word that only makes them giggle. He was born in Hanover in 1738, at a time when it was unified with England under the Georgian monarchy. He never formally trained as an astronomer, and indeed did not pick up a telescope until the age of 35. For most of his life, he was a musician and a composer. In 1756, during the Seven Years' War with France, Herschel enlisted as a military musician and traveled to England in anticipation of the invasion that never came. In the few months he was there, he learned English well enough to read John Locke's works on liberal philosophy. A year later, the French did invade Hanover, forcing William to emigrate to England permanently. In 1766, he was appointed organist at the Chic Octagon Chapel in the spa town of Bath, where he would live for the next two decades. While there, despite having emigrated from stolid German lands, he developed into a very typical English eccentric, following a heroic work ethic with almost monomaniacal obsessiveness. Whilst building his first telescope, he would often work 16-hour days and forego food until his sister Caroline, who acted as his assistant until his death, sneaked it into his mouth. He also combined a keen self-taught knowledge of astronomy with a willingness to think outside the box. Sometimes a few blocks outside it. His first submitted scientific paper, concerning methods for determining the heights of mountains on the moon, was rejected because it featured too much speculation about the moon's intelligent inhabitants, he also later claimed that the sun was inhabited, and that sunspots were openings through which the black clouds in the solar sky could be seen, protecting the inhabitants below from the searing surface. In 1781, while pursuing one of his out-of-the-box ideas, Herschel made the discovery that would make him immortal. He had speculated that the recently discovered double stars were in fact far apart, but aligned coincidentally through line of sight from Earth, which would make them ideal candidates for parallax measurements. Okay, at this point, I feel obliged to stop for a moment and explain what parallax actually is. Despite its rather fancy name, parallax is something you've all seen. 
Hold a pencil up right in front of your face. Place your hand first over one eye and then the other. You will see that the pencil appears to move against the background. That is parallax. A little experimentation will show you that the closer the pencil is to your eyes, the more it appears to move. In fact, the relationship is direct and can be expressed mathematically. The fact that the stars appear to show no visible parallax was, for thousands of years, the strongest evidence against the Earth's movement around the Sun. If the Earth did move, the philosophers argued, then we would see the nearer stars appear to shift against the background as the Earth traveled from one side of the Sun to the other. By the time of Herschel, Newton's elegant universe had pretty much convinced everyone of the heliocentric model, but stellar parallaxes, still unobserved despite two centuries of telescope development, had become the holy grail of astronomy. For, by observing them, we could finally gauge the distances to the stars and gain our first true knowledge of the size of our universe. Herschel's belief that binary stars would provide the answer was considered highly dubious by his astronomical colleagues, who reminded him that statistics alone meant that the probability of any two stars being so aligned by chance was effectively nil, and that binary stars were far more likely to be locked in gravitational orbits around each other. Herschel may have temporarily lost himself down this blind alley, and in fact, he died six years before the first stellar parallax was finally observed. But it says something both for his character and his intellect, that the man who ultimately proved that binary stars were gravitationally bound, and in fact coined the term binary star, was William Herschel. On the night of the 13th of March, 1781, while searching out binary stars, he chanced upon something rather odd in the constellation Gemini, a star of uncommon brightness, which he initially took to be a comet. The next night he observed it again, and concluded that it was indeed a comet, since it had changed its position. He also noted that, unlike the stars, this object increased in size with magnification, just as would be expected if it were within the solar system. Herschel published his account of a comet on the 26th of April, 1781, in the Journal of the Royal Society, and almost immediately created a sensation. For some, Herschel's claims were ridiculous, as they couldn't see the object at all, and upon seeing Herschel's claim magnification, they branded him a charlatan. No one could possibly have a telescope as good as he claimed. In fact, Herschel did, for he and his brother had unwittingly so mastered the art of telescope manufacture that their magnifications were ten times beyond those used by the professional astronomers of his day. In future years, once the true identity of Herschel's comet became known and his position in history was secure, many writers would claim the discovery was made by chance. In fact, Herschel, with not only his beyond state-of-the-art equipment, but his ceaseless dedication to observing the entire sky, was likely the only person in the world who could have made it. Once his fellow astronomers were satisfied that his object existed, their argument shifted to what it actually was. Herschel believed it to be a comet, and in fact held on to that belief far longer than many of his colleagues. His belief was perfectly understandable. At the time, comets were the only thing known to orbit the sun besides planets, and Lord knew it could not be one of those. The five planets visible to the naked eye, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, had been the limits of our understanding for 3,000 years. Herschel could no more expect it to have found another planet than to have accidentally stumbled across a mislaid continent. Just adding Earth to the roster had taken a century of wrangling and persecution. Had he, in one night and entirely unwitting, rewritten our entire concept of the universe? Actually, acceptance of Herschel's discovery as a planet was remarkably quick and uncontroversial. Its orbit was circular, unlike a comet's elliptical orbit, and it lacked the traits one expected to find with comets, such as a coma or a tail. And since, if it wasn't a comet, there was nothing else to call it but a planet, then a planet it became. By 1783, even Herschel was convinced, and acknowledged having found a planet to the president of the Royal Society. The only real controversy was over what to name it, and by now you probably know that the final choice was Uranus. The story of how Uranus gained its singularly unfortunate name is summed up very well in CGP Ray's video on the topic, and doesn't need to be dealt with here. Herschel's role in expanding our knowledge of the solar system did not end with his planet, which, as it became better known, would unleash several dragons of its own, one of which would see Herschel drafted into a cosmic police force, and force me to tangle with two of the least pronounceable names in astronomical history. In 1766, a German astronomer named Johann Daniel Tietz, who Latinized his name to Titius, which because this video already has one unintentionally hilarious name to deal with, I will pronounce Titius, 
it discovered a curious pattern in the order of the planets. The precise distances between the planets were only imperfectly known at this point. The great transit of Venus, whose parallax would eventually fix the distance from the Earth to the Sun, had only just happened five years earlier, and wouldn't produce its final result until 1771. However, thanks to Newton, it was possible to know the relative distances of the planets from each other, expressed as either fractions or multiples of the Earth's distance from the Sun. The Earth-Sun distance, known as the Astronomical Unit, or AU, is still the standard unit for interplanetary distances, both in our solar system and in others. The pattern Titius noted works like this. If you start at zero, then add three, then double it, then double it again, then double it again, etc., and add four to each number, and then divide by ten, the result is a surprisingly close approximation to the orbital distances of the planets in AU. While compelling, the pattern was seen as little more than a curiosity, because it only worked if you allowed for a gap between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter, where, according to the rule, there should be a planet, but none had ever been seen. In 1768, the astronomer Johann Ellert Bode, who, being German, likely pronounced his name Bode, but everyone says Bode, so I will too, incorporated the rule into one of his books without crediting Titius, which meant that for a time it came to be called Bode's Law, but is now more often called the Titius-Bode Law. The discovery of Uranus shot the Titius-Bode Law from idle fancy into the realm of serious science, for the planet matched its predicted position almost exactly. No one doubted any more. The titius bode law was real, which meant the solar system was broken. The region between Mars and Jupiter must be home to some improbably faint planet. Such a flagrant violation of cosmic symmetry could not stand, and in 1800, Baron Franz Sauer von Sach, director of the Gotha Observatory, assembled a task force to bring the universe to order. The group which included Herschel, astronomer Royal Neville Maskelyne, and Charles Messier, the famed cataloger of astronomical oddities, and the reason nearly every well-known galaxy is called M some number, came to be known as the Himmel's Polizei, or Heaven's Police. Every policeman needs a beat, and each member of the Himmel's Polizei was given a 15-degree arc of the sky to search, leaving nowhere for the wayward planet to hide. They were primed. They were vigilant. They were scooped. Less than a year after the Himmels Polizei formed, on the 1st of January 1801, a Sicilian astronomer named Giuseppe Piazzi discovered another so-called comet in the exact region between Mars and Jupiter predicted by the Titius Bode law. While he was careful to describe it as a comet in public, he expressed doubts in a letter to his best friend, Barnabo Oriani, noting that, like Uranus, it did not behave or look like a comet, and maybe another planet. While acquainted with several members of the Himmelspolizei, Piazzi was completely unaware of their plans. His submarining of their efforts was totally unintentional. Assuming it was a planet, Piazzi christened his object Ceres, after the Roman goddess of the harvest and patron of Sicily. Needless to say, controversy was immediate. Several astronomers, despite having yet to see it themselves, decided to give it their own names, much to Piazzi's chagrin. Several searches were undertaken to locate Piazzi's planet, but found nothing leading some to label it just another phantom. It wasn't until the following year that von Zach and fellow Heaven's policeman Heinrich Olbers were finally able to locate the coquette, as von Zach called it, and put it to rights. And then, only a few months later, on the 28th of March, 1802, a bomb fell. Olbers found a second object in roughly the same orbit as Ceres, which he named Pallas. Two planets in the same orbit? What mad universe was this? It was, of course, William Herschel, who, jumping nimbly about a century ahead of his time, saw the truth of the matter. Herschel had already determined from telescopic experiment that the reason that these two objects were so dim was not because they were dark, but because they were small, incomprehensibly small. For that, they could not be called planets, which were all very large objects, nor could they be called comets, because they lacked the latter's elliptical orbit or a beautiful tail. In a letter to the Royal Society, he wrote, quote, Neither the appellation of planets, nor that of comets, can with any propriety of language be given to these two stars. They resemble small stars so much as hardly to be distinguished from them. From this, their asteroidal appearance, if I take my name and call them asteroids, reserving for myself, however, the liberty of changing that name if another, more expressive of their nature, should occur. 
The wider world, however, was slow to embrace Herschel's wisdom. This was partly because, after Juno in 1804 and Vesta in 1807, no new objects were discovered in the region for nearly 40 years, and it was simpler to refer to them as new planets. Within 10 years of the fifth being found, however, there were 37. In 20 years, there were 85. In 30 years, 157. By then, astronomers had long given up thinking of these objects as planets, and had started referring to them as minor planets though the term asteroid only fell into common usage early in the 20th century when astronomers started noticing minor planets everywhere in the solar system. William Herschel's discovery of Uranus brought him everlasting fame, but little in the way of fortune. The 200-pound stipend he received from George III, on condition that he quit his job at the chapel to pursue astronomy full-time, may have freed him to follow his life's passion, but it was still a 50% pay cut and Herschel himself never attached much significance to his signature accomplishment, considering it a scientific trifle, or sideshow. The mere unveiling of an entirely new planet was as nothing when compared to the true goal of astronomy, which was to understand the structure and composition of the universe. For him, the planet he found was secondary to the parallaxes he was searching for when he found it. It is sad to think that most of the answers which Herschel sought for his entire life would be left to those who followed him, on until today. The lives and accomplishments of William Herschel, his sister Caroline, and his son John would make a fascinating video series in their own right. I'm particularly sad to have sidelined Caroline, a celebrated astronomer who discovered eight comets, and the first woman to be awarded the Royal Astronomical Society's gold medal. The next one, incidentally, was in 1996. Perhaps one day I will pay this remarkable family another visit. Astute viewers of my videos may have noticed that this episode on Planet X has not actually mentioned Planet X yet. Of those sharp-eared listeners, I humbly ask patience. This story is a long and complex one, and groundwork must be laid. Much of this will come to bear later, particularly when I talk about Pluto. The Titius Bode Law, however, I ask you to dispense with from here. Neptune's discovery in 1846 sent the queer little ratio back to the curiosity shop, since the planet was far closer to the sun than the law predicted. Infuriatingly, Pluto was found to be exactly where the law predicted. For Neptune. Newly discovered distant objects like Sedna and Eris do not follow the law at all, and most astronomers these days are comfortable calling it a coincidence. But while that dragon may have proven illusory, another dragon unleashed by Herschel's planet would prove very real indeed, and it will reveal itself in the next episode. <laughs>